at a Metropole TVKE across all your social media platforms on our website www.metropoletv.co.ke. My name is Simba Elijah Charles Kiaga. Welcome to yet another edition of a Business AM. Let's introduce the subject that we're talking about this morning. I mean, it's slightly above 200 days to the general election. That is the August 2022 election. So the question is now, how is the current political environment affecting business or going to affect business and economy in the coming few days? Now, Kenya generally has a history of where the economy assumes a wait and see approach Every time we gear towards the general election, is that the same thing that we are going to expect this time around? Is that the same thing that we are getting this time around? That is a question we are asking as we come to the end of 2021. And in the studio this morning, I am joined by Cliff Otega, who is a policy and governance analyst. Cliff. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Simba, and uh, thanks for having me on. Huh? Any time, man. Yes. Okay. So uh, there's a number of things we want to unpack today. Yes. Okay. And uh, one of the best predictors of what we'll see in the future is what has happened in the past. Yes. Okay. Yes. So just recently, last week actually, we um, listened to the president give his State of the Nation address, 2021. Yes. And one figure that stuck out that uh, analysts are still debating today is he told us that in 2017. Um, after the elections, the Kenyan economy lost one trillion shillings. It's a huge figure. That's a huge okay? figure, it's a isn't huge it? Figure. Especially after the 2017 election. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So because of that stalemate that yes. we had with the nullification and, you know, the, 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 the street uh, riots and violence and that back and forth yes. until um, what we now know as the handshake. Yes. Okay? So in an economy that today, the president also told us, is worth 11.1 uh, trillion shillings, you know, GDP, yes. that means that in six months we lost close to 10% of our GDP. And that's a huge, a huge figure, number. Cliff, especially when you look at how the economy has been growing, isn't it? Yes, 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 yes. So when you look at it like that, we're not a rich country, of course, yeah? Um, our GDP is impressive by East African standards, but yes. that's a low base. And we know that um, the GDP per capita for Kenyans is hardly, you know, about 100,000 shillings per annum. So we, we, are, we were already struggling before 2017, and you can imagine we wiped um, out 10% of our GDP. If that is repeated after 2021, for whatever reason, then we're in big trouble. And there's a number of reasons why we'd be in very big trouble. Yes. Yes. So one of the reasons, um, and I think we need to start with the elephant in the room, is our debt crisis. I'm calling it a debt crisis. Some people are a bit reluctant. They're saying, no, 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 we might have overborrowed. It's just a matter of how you pay. But I, today, I'm calling it a debt crisis. And this is why. Um, currently, this week, we owe 7.7 .7 trillion okay, to domestic and international lenders, you know, of whatever class, bilateral, multilateral, and that sort of thing. Now, the challenge with that is that uh, we're already seeing it in the way that our country operates. I saw an article yesterday that our secondary schools have only received half of what they call capitation, basically the funds to fund uh, public education. They've only yes. received half yes. of what they're supposed to receive for term two. Our universities are bankrupt. I think we've all seen I that. I think that we've all seen that. Yes, Even more the competition they've received now yes. uh, is only counting for 49% yes. instead of the 80% it's supposed to account for. Yes, yes, yes. And those are just basic examples, okay? There are more um, the intrinsic things around uh, our salaries being paid on time. Is the government able to deliver services that they need to deliver on time? So that's a big problem for yes. us, okay? And yes. that can only get worse. And I'll give you an example. Zambia, which is one of our regional neighbors, just had an election in August, okay? And at that time, they were in a similar situation to us debating this debt thing. When the new president came in just a couple of months ago, they've taken an example, and nothing against China, but they've just taken an example, and yes. they said that the disclosed debt, Chinese debt in Zambia, before the election was $3.6 billion. After the election, and they've done their math again, that number has shot up to $6.6 billion. Oh, so double the figure. Yes. yes. So in Kenya as well, there's been a long-running debate, especially over the couple, last couple of years, of how much we truly owe. Because there's not just the debt that we have on our books, international debt and bonds and that sort of thing. The government also underwrites 
um, the parastatal debt, yes. okay? Yeah, yes. because parastatal um, companies obviously are ultimately government entities. Yes. So we're also underwriting that. So there's a big back and forth about how much we really owe. So we have to, we have to get a grip on that. Whatever happens between now and the election and immediately after is so important about how we manage our debt. Now, there are two ways we can do it. Zambia today have gone back to the IMF. You know, that's basically a begging bowl. You're asking for a bailout. IMF comes with austerity. So you stop spending and we lose jobs, especially public sector jobs. Yes. Or we can have um, what we call the Hail Mary approach, where we do a complete economic uh, restructure. And then we look at um, some form of reorganization of the economy. Yes. And this is where politics comes in. So we have two uh, sides of the political divide now. One side is talking about a bottom-up approach, okay? Pretty much. Yes, so that to me is like an economic restructure. Well, which, is, which is exactly yes. what I wanted to get into, Clay. Just okay. before we look into that, I, um, and I know we're talking about what the effects of the politics would be in a 2022 for business and the economy, but I want us to go back and look at exactly where we are in terms of those, in terms of those GDP figures. And we're going to compare 2017 versus the COVID-19 pandemic. So we can look at it and then say, which one is a big effect? If we, want, if we could actually just uh, go back to those GDP numbers, we have them there right now. Uh, Cliff, you could just look at them. You will see exactly what 2017 was. That's when we experienced the, I mean, what we would like to call the slowest growth rate within those uh, quarters. Because you see, we started from 5.2, went back to 4.4, and then went to 4.5, and then rebounded to just 5. Point one, you will say the effect of the coronavirus pandemic. Because if we go back again to years like 2018 and, and, and 2019, you will see that's when we have what you like to call a healthy growth rate. We are touching the 6.5 percent mark. But then, yes. if you go to the next one now, again in terms of the, those GDP numbers, you're going to say that we closed 2020 with a contraction of 0.3 percent. That's when our economy actually was on the negative question that I keep on posing to all political analysts, especially when we look at the economic growth, the effects of politics vis-a-vis -vis coronavirus pandemic. Are we saying that with the death situation that we are right now in this country, that bad politics in 2022 might come worse off than the coronavirus pandemic has been to the economy? We, we can't tell and we don't want to be too pessimistic. Yes. It might not be as bad because um, Corona was something that hit us hard. Yes. It was unknown. It yes. was uncontrollable. It's still uncontrollable yes. now. We're talking about ways to mitigate it now with vaccines and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, with politics, it is within our control. Yes. But the problem is it will exacerbate what Corona has already done to our economy. Yes. Because how do we get out of um, the coronavirus pandemic from an economic perspective? We need to open up the economy, yes. and I think we've started to do that, but people are cautious, okay? Because you're opening up the economy now, but, but you're already de dealing with a population that is highly risk averse because savings have been wiped out, you know, um, at household and farm level. And um, also there's that trepidation that comes with any election period. So what we needed to do to get out was to get, uh, to get out of the pandemic and start to regrow our economy yes. was to give the business environment uh, confidence, you know, in business people and, and, and one inch as well, you know, yes. to give them the confidence to go out and make the sort of investments that, that our economy needs to grow. Pretty so much. of course, if um, we do our politics as we have always done it over the past, you know, uh, 10, 15 years, where we begin with very negative rhetoric, you know, um, we are dividing Kenyans maybe around ethnic lines and that sort of thing, then what do people do? Naturally, you pull back from investment and you say you adopt a wait and see attitude. So we might not see, and we hope that we don't see yes. that sort of contraction, yes. because that one was largely about people, you know, not being able to work and being uh, basically locked up in their house and that sort of thing. Here, we are dealing with the mindset. Okay, so people are saying I will just pref I prefer to wait till 2023 and see what happens. So we may not, and hopefully we don't see a contraction, but I think we'll see um, very tepid growth as people focus on yes. the election. Another question again, uh, again, Cliff, when you look at approaching 2022, and I know you're pretty much astounded when um, Okuri Yatani came on the other day and said that if he says that things are all right when it comes to the way that the government's uh, debt accumulation is going on, he actually said he will be lying. When he was telling Uhuru Kenyatta, with the way things are going, declining revenue growth and the um, sluggish economic performance, then we are at the red line. Is our debt, 
a political issue, Cliff? I think it's the biggest because. Um, Would you blame it on Uhuru Kenyatta and not set? Um, when, when, okay. when, when the Treasury says, yes. you know, he's given him that job, so we like to think that even before we accrue that debt, then there's um, a, a back and forth process that goes in on exactly whether we can actually be able to accommodate it. The projects that we're running under right now, whether we can actually be able to accommodate them all the way to 2022. So when your boss comes in over the other side and says, hey, Cliff, the way things are going, man, it's not, it's not good. Is Uhuru Kenyatta pushing so much for his project that he doesn't care exactly what happens after 2022 because he pretty much knows it will be out? I, I would hope that's not his attitude, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but um, if, we're, if we're looking to blame yes. people, okay, and I don't like a blame game, but we must, I, I would think about it as let's ascribe responsibility yes. to different parties. Yes. The first group of people that we have to look at is our parliament. We have very well well paid parliamentarians, and this is one of their key yes. roles. Okay, yes. legislatively, there's a finance bill that they're presented with every single year, and they need to analyze it. It talks about our revenue, it talks about our expenditure. They are the first group that we have to hold responsible. Yes. But you're right. At ultimately, because this is a government and these are separate terms of government, the buck must stop with the executive because they are the ones that ultimately propose the projects. They are the ones responsible for imp implementation and we have to hold them accountable. So we've had such a huge focus on macroeconomics and uh, we can debate, and I think we will debate for many years, yes. if all these thousands of projects were really necessary at that time and at that pace and at that cost. Yes. Okay? So that we must also lay squarely at the door of the executive. So if, if you want an answer, yes or no, answer of course yes then the bug stops yes. at the office of uh, the president yes yes pretty much mm -hmm. now you are talking about how we are gearing ourselves for 2022 and cliff i want you to be honest with me because indeed yes now there are the two sides that we know that are leading for 2022 uh right as we speak right now we do know that he's at uh, kasarani uh holding um that rally for his presidential bid for 2022 when you listen to the politics right now, and I know we're going to look at that data uh, sent this morning and try and fit it somewhere. And if, only, if you could actually give us that data for credit to the private sector, so Cliff can actually lay that argument on that area. Again, yes, we might look at those numbers, good numbers, healthy numbers in terms of a balance that is going to the private sector. But then if we move to the next data set then and talk about it in percentages now, that is uh, up to November 2020, even if you could jump into the next one, then you're going to say, Yes, that's the same same data set. Let's talk about percentages now. There's 2021 around the same area as well. You can see not much of an improvement in terms of the credit that's going to the private sector. All right, let's move on to the next one in terms of percentage. Now, that's where the conversation comes in, Cliff. Single digits. We are in 2021, but we've not even crossed to double digits in terms of credit to the private sector. Now, if you look at these two factions that are gearing for 2022, do you think that these conversations about bottom-up, I don't know what Raila Mulodinga has for us as well, do you think that indeed they have solutions to the growth of the economy? Because for a very long time, Cliff, our politics have been not uh, policy-based. You and I do know that. When you look at these two factions that we have right now, do you believe that we have a policy in terms of them going for office in 2022? Uh, I'd say yes, yes and no. Uh, yes, because um, if we look at um, the bottom-up uh, economic model that has been proposed, yes, okay, yes. by, I guess we'll call them the Haslam yes, mission, yes. because that has been rolled out over a period of time, it's beginning to crystallize. So has, it, has it been, Cliff? In terms of like in how it's been rolled out in, in, to the public, so yes. we have a number, yes. you know, like even yesterday I watched a clip and I heard uh, the deputy president say yes. that they will direct 100 billion shillings to uplifting a cert uh, certain groups of people. Okay, Cliff, just hold on yes. there. Well, when you look at this promise that the bottom-up approach, is it not the same one that the 2010 constitution is promising Kenyans, where the single uh, most um, valued uh, growth um, line for the economy is the word. So we're sort of approaching it from top, is it the bottom-up, yes? We're approaching it from the word up to the national level. Is that not what it is? 
So if it is, then the answer to that question is then, why did we not begin to implement that? Because in 2013, yes. when we had a new, the first new government yes. that was basically under the new constitution, we went completely opposite and we, would, we, 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 we approached our economic growth from a macroeconomic perspective. Yes. We, say, we looked at it and I've heard people say it again, it was infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. So we said we're going to make a massive bet okay, on one item, for example, the SGR. And we said, let's, let's spend six billion I'm um, sorry, six, uh, yeah, six billion shillings on that, okay? Yes. Yeah, or sorry, 600 billion yes. shillings on that, six yes. billion dollars. Yes, and then that is going to be something that is going to have a domino effect on the economy. Unfortunately, we're not seeing that. So we, we, we must go back, okay, to basics and understand where we went wrong. So this bottom-up model then looks at obviously overturning that. And I've seen, you know, because we watch these commentaries uh, and, and they're beginning to explain themselves more and more and more. Yes. And I think I would urge the parties now to come out with their written manifestos so that those can be in interrogated. Because if you're saying that you're going to use from the same bucket, are you telling us that now you would not in the next five years build something like the SGR or extend it and you would now take the, um, those hundreds of billions and plow them into the economy at a microeconomic level. If you're saying that, you need to put it down and we need to interrogate that. Yes. And to interrogate it, you know, I'll give you an example. You see, like in the US, uh, they have a congressional budget office. When you make policy proposals like this, both sides of politics, okay, then they do an in-depth analysis and they cost it and they align it to the budget and they tell the public it openly, this actually is possible or this would be the impact of, of uh, your proposal on the economy. Yes. We're not doing that. We yes. do have a parliamentary budget office, but I wish that they could come out boldly and also cost these proposals because otherwise we are basically just it's a stab in the dark you know and we don't know what will happen until um, you've actually gone and implemented it and then with five years later we we, we are waiting for the outcome but the problem is now yes. we don't have that room to guess yes you know we just don't have it so we have to make a very clear decision either we stop building infrastructure at the rate at which we are building it yes and then direct th that fund or those funds to this um, bottom up or you know whatever you want to call it yes. because i yes. think even even the azimio side of economics is talking about a similar thing although the only pronouncement that we've had from um, the former prime minister is he's said six thousand shillings to every needy individual or household okay and i think the figure has come to about 140 billion a year um, not too different from the hundred not billion, too yeah, from not the 100 too billion, billion, yeah. Yes. But we don't know what the impact is. We yes. can analyze it yes. ourselves, yes. but until they tell us where the money will come from directly, so we need to look at our budget, say from last year, and say we budgeted say one trillion on infrastructure. So now we're going to cut that number down to six hundred billion, and then we'll plow four hundred billion into this other approach. Without that. It's a stab in the dark, and yes. I fear that we could end up even worse than where we are today. Pretty much. Just before I, I ask you just to, uh, to to tell us about what you feel about the, the economic climate now and the political climate as we approach 2022, I just want us to look at the next data set that we have this morning, our expenditure uh, versus GDP growth rate. If only you could show us that data so that we question whether we need to change that model as we move into 2022. Just the next data set, if only you could, the expenditure versus GDP contribution, because we've already looked at uh, Kenya's uh, GDP and your growth rate. Just as we wait for that data, because there's a very mm -hmm. nice uh, conversation point, if only you could move on to the next data, expenditure versus GDP growth rate. You have it? All right. Just as we wait for that data set to appear, um, Cliff, we are moving into 2022. And every single time our economy stops, Cliff, do you feel that this time around it's different, especially after the failure of BBI? Did we go back again to where we were um, in, in, in our formative years again if we did not pass BBI? Do you feel that we have the confidence that this is going to be a clear cut process and will come out of it saying that the economy did not suffer any other jitters of the election. Uh, it's unlikely. It's unlikely. Any because, telltale signs? Yes. Um, yeah, the telltale signs are already, like we had said, we're coming out of a once in a generation pandemic. Yes. Okay? Yes. So already business confidence is shattered. Yes. Um, recently we saw a statistic 
I think it was a CBK report where they said 35% of MSM, MSMEs in Kenya were wiped out over the corona. It's not that they're faltering or whatever. They're gone. Those businesses are gone. Completely. Okay, right? completely. Yeah. So now you already have that 35%. And remember, these MSMEs are responsible for about 90% of the employment in Kenya. Okay? So those are gone. 35% are gone. Now, you take people that are already struggling and then you rush them into an electoral process. Or not rush them, but you, you move them into an electoral process, okay? And it must be divisive because that's how elections are fought in Kenya. They must be um, an, an antagonist and a protagonist, okay? And we don't have a clear pathway that gives business uh, people confidence. So, for example, look at the IBC. The IBC, to me, seems to be floundering. They had asked for a budget of, I think, 40 plus billion. They got less than half of that. You saw what happened with the voter registration. Yes. People blame it on apathy, but it was also very poorly rolled out. I can tell you because um, I also concern myself with politics in uh, my ward where I live, okay? Yes. Kineleshwa. Out of five polling stations, there are only three of these uh, BVR registration kits. So it was like a cat and mouse game to try and get that registration going. So the IBC are blaming that on uh, a funding issue. Okay? Yes. Then you saw somebody went to court and said, let's extend this. And they said, okay, we extended it. Then they were spending over, they were spending, I think, two or three million a day in that process. So it's a total mess where we are now. And then now we are awaiting yet another registration period in January. So all these stop start, what message does it send to the economy? And then you have, I think, what is going to be the longest campaign season in Kenya's history. The IBC again has said people are campaigning prematurely and it's an ele election offense. We're not seeing any change. When you look at the number of people that are drawn by politicians, the political crowds, doesn't that make you sit up and think, wow, what do all these people do apart from, like, what, what could they be doing? on a Tuesday afternoon. Gidura is a famous place. We've seen that a number of times. Yes. Everybody goes yes. there. Yes. Where do those people come from? Do they not have um, gainful employment, which, which is what we would expect on a Tuesday afternoon? So you asked about telltale signs. Those are the telltale signs. The political rhetoric that keeps uh, ratcheting up. IBC not itself um, expressing confidence in, uh, in terms of the way it's leading the electoral process. And then the ability of politicians to master tens of thousands, you know, or maybe exaggerate a, bi a, a bit, but thousands of people, you know, at the drop of a hat. That yes. tells you that um, we do have a problem in terms of where the economy is heading vis-a-vis uh, -vis politics. Pretty much. So, lastly, as we come uh, to the end of this conversation this morning, again, talk to me then about how you've seen the two factions relate. We have a very, you like to call a unique setup as we go into 2022, mm -hmm. when you have the DP who's part of the government criticizing the same, same government it is in for not delivering promises to Kenyans. That sort of setup, um, Cliff, does it give you confidence that we've matured politically to the point that our political ambitions would be sort of geared towards developing the economy or is this politics? for politics. I want to get there and not say that. I want to prove that I can actually win. Have we moved away from that? And what do you, how do you think, Cliff, again, we're, we're going to be, account, we want to make our politicians more accountable. Has our economy grown to that point? What we'll say, well, you promised us this. We haven't seen it. And this government, to be very particular, promised a lot, Cliff. I mean, look, look at the manifesto. Yes. It was spectacular. We said, this is it. Have we gone to that point where we're making these politicians accountable or we are still that economy where if you don't get the right leader who would actually live on towards delivering the manifesto, then it becomes nothing after 10 years or five years of them being in government. Mm -hmm. So I think we're not there yet. Uh, politically, we're not. Because one of the things that, um, to, to add to your observation, yes. not only is the DP criticizing the government that he's still part of, the opposition leader now seems to have taken up that DP role, okay? <laughs> so it, 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 it's mind-boggling, you yes. know? Yeah, this yes. is fodder for, for political analysts because it's something that you, we haven't seen, you know, yes. in Kenya before. But um, the challenge we have is we still have that, um, what they're talking about with the BBI process, that winner-takes-all mentality, okay? And it's, it's a fight. It's, it's like do or die for both political factions. I don't think it should be like that. And perhaps maybe one of the things that uh, the BBI intended to do, but towards the end did not seem to actually uh, be headed towards, yes. was to find a way 
to cushion losers so that we would end the culture of um, winner takes all and uh, the people that did not win just ending up with nothing and losing face. But I don't think towards the end the BBI morphed into something else. Okay, And it looked like it was something that was uh, only being structured for this 2022 election. That's how it looked, you know. Yes. Yeah, whether that was um, because of the politics uh, for and against it, that's how it ended up being in the minds of, of, of many Kenyans. Yeah. So we're not there yet. And uh, one of the challenges for any politician is, um, especially if you've been in office for a long time, okay, which all of our politicians have, is how do you justify uh, putting yourself forward as the person to change Kenya when you've already had 10, 20 years, in some cases 30 years, to do that and you have not demonstrated that you can do that credibly. It's a big thing, and I think that's why we have a political campaign season. So I want to be an optimist, and I want to say, look, then because there's, there are no other takers, if we had like some sort of political messiah that had come onto the scene, okay, you know, like how Barack Obama burst out, uh, burst onto the scene in the United States, if we had that, then we can rally behind such a person. But now we are Kenyans, we have nowhere else to go, so we have to make what might be a difficult choice for many. And the only way to do that is to listen to what they're saying, but we must interrogate. This time Kenyans must interrogate Pretty what much. we are being told. Pretty much. All right, in 45 seconds, as we clear off, 2021 is pretty mm. much done. We're going to welcome in 2022. What would give you confidence that our economy might not get into jitters in the early stages of 2022? What must the current government do just to contain the election jitters that normally grip the economy just before we get into that August date. Okay, so uh, there's a number of things, but I'll just summarize them. Number one, there needs to be a laser focus. Um, sort of a way, the government itself needs to focus back on the economy. One of the things that we can do, Pending bills is a huge problem. It's strangling the economy. The number this as of yesterday was 423 billion. You know, that's um, I think it's about three percent of our huge. GDP. Okay, mm -hmm. and almost uh, above 10 percent of our annual uh, revenue. You know that carry collects. Yes. That must be sorted. Okay, because that is what gives confidence. So we need to stop whatever else we are doing. No more new projects because that to me becomes another feeding trough as we move into an election. You know, people create different projects. So let's focus you know, on getting that 423 billion back into the economy. You can't get a better stimulus than that, Simba. Pretty much. Thank Cliff, thank you very much for coming by, man. Thank you. It was a thank pleasure you. speaking to you. Excellent. That is uh, Cliff Otega, who is um, a policy and a government uh, an governance analyst. Yes, well, we shall be having him more often, especially when we open a 2022 officially. Just looking forward to how 2022 is wearing on because as far as we do know, campaigns are already here and the businesses and the economy and the world economy is watching our politicians run around in the name of campaigning for projects, but what we do know they're doing is campaigning for office. We take a short break once we come back. Let's look at how the banking industry has fared on in 2021. Good morning.